I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you may bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. I'm uh, really pleased uh, to be here with you for various reasons. I'm going to wander, so sorry, Carl, if I wander the camera, I'll try to stand still. Um, I'm very pleased. I'm nervous because I don't do this very often, um, but uh, I am also pleased to be with you. I've been praying for you. I got to uh, the, the Hillview um, uh, congregation. I've been praying for you for a long time. My parents, until very recently. Uh, lived in the village, and every time as I come into the village, I've been praying uh, for you. How, you know, how can God get you a building that would be near the middle of near the middle of the village? Uh, every time as I come through the village, um, and uh, long before it was being talked about, and so it's really exciting that that is looking like a possibility, and still praying for that to be able to come uh, into fruition. Um, as Colin said, I wasn't meant to be here. I was meant to be just preaching this at Hillview. Uh, next week, and normally, um, if, if uh, Martin had phoned me up uh, and said, could you do it a week early, uh, and there would be no chance at all that I'd have been ready because I'm a last minute person, but courtesy of a uh, rather hurried and uh, urgent sudden trip to Dundee in my wife's car to take my children somewhere, uh, when there were various problems with broken cars and uh, missed trains and all sorts of things. I ended up in Dundee with my wife's new electric car with not enough electricity to get back. Um, And uh, a powder paper because my laptop was uh, out of charge uh, and sitting in a cafe for a few hours. Um, So I started preparing this. I was half prepared when Martin phoned. So um, here I am. Um, But I'm also uh, genuinely excited because you are, as a congregation, uh, uh, a key point in your journey of planting church cycle. You're thinking about the next phase. And this uh, talk is about what it looks like to be followers of Jesus. And so I'm really asking you the question together, what does it look like for you to be followers of Jesus together as you build this church, as God builds this church in you? So that's the kind of context that I'm thinking of. What does it look like to be followers of Jesus? And Jesus answers that question as Esther read for us. Thank you, Esther. His answer was, it looks like a vine. And that doesn't immediately ring any bells with us, does it? But it did for the disciples. So we're going to unpack a little bit of what that meant for the disciples, first of all, when they heard that image. And then 
for longer look at what it means to be branches and what that means in practice together. So the disciples have been following Jesus around. As followers of Jesus have literally been following around the countryside for three years and listening. But also as followers, uh, they were followers of him as a teacher. They were his pupils. They were listening to his words. They were getting sent out uh, to try things out for themselves and brought back and unpack what they did. Find out what Jesus' priorities uh, were to follow his actions. But now Jesus was saying to them that he was going to be leaving, he was going to be going away. Maybe they were beginning to grasp that he was going to die. And they were confused and they were anxious. What's this going to look like if you're not here, Jesus? How do we follow? And so Jesus gives them this answer. He gives them a picture. Following me is going to look like a vine. So I don't know how many of you have seen a uh, vine, a grapevine. It's not something that I grow in my garden. It's a bit too cold in the northeast of Scotland. Uh, but for the disciples, that would have been a familiar image of this bush tree thing with a big stem and, a, and spreading out. And then if you let it grow wild, it's all just a higgle, tickledy piggledy mass of branches. But if you're the gardener or the vine dresser, as it said in the ESV, um, you prune the branches so that they're splayed out and spread out, so that the strong branches are separated from one another, so each can get light and each can produce fruit and produce good fruit. That's what we're kind of imagining with this vine. When the disciples heard this word vine, they would have been able to think of that. However, they trained them in those days. But they also would have thought about it in another way. Because the image of a vine goes way back to their Bible, the Old Testament, where the vine represented the Israel nation, God's chosen people. Um, it meant something to them, it was their identity. From the earliest days as a people, when they were just an extended family of Abraham, they were promised that they would be uh, blessing through the whole, to the whole earth. Their job as the vine was to be God's representatives to the whole world. But it had gone stale. It was a bit like these grapes. I meant to have fresh grapes to show you, but I forgot. Um, courtesy of our lodgers, I found these rather mouldy ones sitting in our kitchen. <laughs> And the grapes that the uh, Israelite family were producing were sour grapes. And all, nearly all the references to Israel being a vineyard talk about the job that they were doing as representing God in his character, in his priorities, in his actions, had gone sour. I'm going to read, you might want to have a look at this. Uh, I'm going to get you to look back at John 15 in a minute. But let's first of all have a look at Isaiah 5. Sorry, I lost my place. So if, if you've got a Bible and you want to flip, or I'm going to read some of it to you, Isaiah 5. This is called the Song of the Vineyard, one of the big passages about the vineyard. Um, and it says that God's planted a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He's dug it up, cleared the stones. He's, uh, verse 2 it says... He's planted it with the choice vines. He's built a watchtower, built a wine press as a well ready for the vines. And he goes out and looks for the grapes. And then at the end of verse 3, verse 2, it says, But it yielded only bad fruit. We skip to verse 7. Um, it says, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah and the vines he delighted in good plan that these people would represent him to the world. But then at the end of verse 7 he said, he looked for justice, good fruit, but he saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. The grapes that they were meant to be producing literally were turning 
sour and moldy. So that was the image. They knew that it was their identity when Jesus spoke about a vine. But they knew it wasn't really working. And Jesus, just like he did earlier when you've been looking at uh, the Passover meal, the last supper they had, where Jesus uh, took a very familiar image to them of bread and wine at a Passover meal and hijacked that and took it to be something really new about him. He's doing the same with the vine. And so Jesus is upcycling this image to be about himself. So let's flip back, or thumb back, to John 15. I want you to have a look as we read, if you've got a Bible to read. I think there are probably some of the back if you want to grab them. I'm using the NIV just because the language is a little bit simpler. But it's all going to say the same, same things. There's some words that we'll talk about as we go through. And John chapter 1 starts by saying, Jesus saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. So yes, you have this picture of a vine, something you're supposed to be. Actually, I am the real thing. Unlike the Israelites, Jesus' fruit was beautiful. He was just like the Father. Not causing bloodshed and distress, his life radiated justice and compassion. Just think about what Jesus was like. Mercy, he brought in the outsiders, he was forgiving, and he was, even before his death, standing as a go-between between God and humans who needed his relationship with him. Jesus was saying he was the true vine, the real thing. And that could be enough end of sermon. Yeah, we've got replacement for the vine, Jesus is it. But that's not where he stops, is it? We've got another 17 verses to go. Oh. So he doesn't stop by saying, uh, I am the vine, just believe in me, and uh, sit tight, wait for heaven, and that's it. He starts bringing us in. He starts talking about you, you being in the vine, talking to his 11 disciples. 11? 11 disciples that were left. But as you'll see in passages coming on, we can translate this into what he has, what his heart is for us. So he starts bringing us back into the picture. And uh, verse 5 he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we, human beings, are back in the picture representing God to the world. So the rest of the morning, we're going to think about what does it mean to be a branch. So we're going to think about our need to be pruned, hopefully not removed, our need to remain, and how do we do that? and loving and fruiting, so that's where we're going. Okay, I'm a teacher normally, um, and you know that teachers don't get very long before they start asking questions, so I'm going to start asking questions now. Um, don't panic, I'm not going to pick on anybody, uh, and uh, it's absolutely fine to shout out without putting your hand up. Um, in fact, I want you to, okay? So, have a look at verse 5, and there's also a big clue in verse 2. Verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. I'm going to let you look. If you've not got a Bible in front of you, don't worry, we're going to give you the answer in a second. My question is, what is a branch for? Anybody, you're going to have to be brave and speak to me. What is a branch for? What's the job of the branch? Bear fruit. Bear fruit, thank you very much. Excellent, go to the top of the class, you get a merit. Okay. Uh, branch's job is to bear fruit. Okay, so we need to pause for a minute and just think what this fruit is. So, uh, I brought some fruit, okay, and I want you to tell me what type of tree this fruit comes from, okay? Type of tree? Orange, Orange tree, yeah, very good, okay. Apple. Apple tree, very good, you're getting the idea. Pear tree, yeah. 
Vine, good, I was checking sure you were still awake, okay? It's not a great tree, but it's the equivalent, isn't it, okay? It's a vine, okay? But what we did just there was just show the, job, the fruit identifies the plant, doesn't it? Yeah, it's how we recognize it's the easiest way, unless you're really good at shapes of leaves and things. Um, and that's the job of the fruit. It's for other people, it's not for the benefit of the, of the, am I dropping grapes? <laughs> benefit, I think I'll just put them back in there. Um, it's not for the benefit of the tree, it's for other people to take the fruit, but it identifies the tree. So we will talk more detail about the fruit in a minute, or towards the end, but the job of our fruit is to show what sort of tree we're part of, the vine that we're part of. So I'm going to uh, play with some English words, sorry if that offends you for a minute, but I'm going to say our fruit is how jesus we are. How jesus are you? How much are you like Jesus? As a group of people, how much are you like Jesus? Because that's your fruit. We'll come back to that at the end, but we just need to keep in mind, vine's job, represent God to the, to the world outside. Branch's job, bear fruit. Fruit, how Jesus-y are you? Okay, just keep that in mind as we go. Okay, let's go back to the passage. And um, Jesus starts almost negatively, doesn't he? Let's read verse one and two, and then five and six. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Verse five, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown in the fire to be burnt. That's a funny place for Jesus to start, taking things off the branches, and it scares us a little bit. But maybe he starts because he's still reconstructing this picture for people of what the vine is. It's no longer that being part of the vine is being there by birth or by right or by who you are or by how often you come to church or by what family you've grown up in. And he's reconstructing this picture of the vine and saying the old vine, well some of those people that may think they're in the vine actually aren't because they're not producing Jesus' fruit. The idea wasn't to get rid of the whole people of Israel, but, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute, but it wasn't automatically that because you were uh, a descendant of Abraham, you were in the vine, and some people were no longer there. But I'm also thinking that Jesus was thinking back to something that happened just maybe half an hour, a few hours beforehand, where Jesus had walked out into the, not Jesus, Judas had walked out into the night. Um, and he'd removed himself from the group. You know, we don't know an awful lot about Judas, do we? But the little bits that we do don't seem to have G Jesus' fruit there. You know, he, he didn't care about the poor. He stole the money. He criticized those that were actually giving devotion to Jesus. And now, perhaps because Jesus wasn't fulfilling his idea of what uh, the Messiah was supposed to be, he went off to betray Jesus. So it's possible to associate with Jesus. Jesus was one of Je Judas was one of Jesus' followers for three years and looked like a follower, but not actually be really connected to what Jesus was doing and saying, and bear no fruit and be cut off from the vine. Is that any of us here that we're just going through emotion, looking like we're followers because it's our routine, but we're not actually connected into the heart of Jesus and only work to be fueled for the fireplace. These are sobering thoughts and we don't like them. It is judgment language. We don't talk about that very often, but Jesus does, so we have to pause for a minute. So here are a few things before we move on to the more positive things. 
Firstly, the Father is the gardener, not us. He's in charge of who's in the vine. It really does matter that if we're becoming Jesus' people, we are living like him and we're producing fruit. It might be that we get worried, how do I know that I'm a real live branch and I'm not just pretending? Well, I'll be producing fruit, even small sour grapes at first, but God can prune us into something better. And sometimes it's hard for us to see that for ourselves. And if you're, if you're struggling with that, am I, am I showing that I'm a Christian? Ask other people. They'll be able to point things out to you. And if you're worried that uh, you're not producing fruit and you're telling God that I want to be producing fruit, you know, you're in the right place, aren't you? Yeah? The danger sign is when you're off doing your own thing and you don't really care or notice. The gardener, the father, is not just a pruner though, is he? He's also an expert grafter. We're going to look for a moment at Romans 11. You don't need to turn up. It's um, maybe difficult to pick the quote out. He's t- Paul is using a similar, but slightly different metaphor, olive tree this time. But he talks about the father grafting in the wild branches, the people that are not part of that original Israel family, but are believers grafting them into the vine to be part of Jesus' life as the vine. So God is a pruner, but he is also an expert grafter. Uh, and, and he wants us to be part of his vine. And finally, before we move on, if you feel that you failed and that your fruit is, fruit is the best sour or small, and you're right for the chop, Jesus, although he was thinking of Judas here, he also, in the same breath when he was telling Judas he was going to betray him, he was telling others, Peter, that Peter would also betray Jesus. And Peter wasn't chopped off, was he? He went through pruning, he remained on the vine, he was forgiven, and he produced abundant fruit. So take hope. As we look at pruning now, that the Father is the gardener, ready to make us fruitful. Okay, so we're going to go and have a look at verse 2 and 3 now. He cuts off every branch in him that bears no fruit, but while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Clean is, uh, Jesus having a little word to play joke here because the, the word in the original clean is, sounds almost identical to prune and he's riffing off the fact that he was, when he was cleaning the disciples' feet, he was saying, you need to be clean here. You're clean all over, but you need to let me do something for you. And here he's talking about God pruning us for our benefit and for his benefit. Remember, representing God to all the people, branches, jobs to produce fruit. Father is the gardener. He's going to prune us to produce more fruit. And our culture says, you're wonderful just the way you are. Do you hear that? Yeah, on the telly, or maybe in school, sometimes we sing about it. It's not quite right. Somebody else said, God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you enough not to leave you just the way you are. He wants to shape you. And remaining in him uh, requires us to be willing to do that. Not just to leave us growing haphazardly, but to shape us into a vine that produces lots of fruit. Now, if we hadn't read this passage, uh, and I'm starting talking about pruning and God uh, shaping our character, what, this is another question coming up, what would we immediately probably jump to as being how God prunes us and shapes us? How does God 
change us into the people he would. Any thoughts? All too shy, it's okay, I'll tell you. Um, often we jump straight to uh, trials and circumstances, don't we? Yeah? And there's lots of evidence for that being the way God shapes us. Uh, if you think about um, Paul's words about um, uh, trials developing perseverance and endurance of character, and words in the Proverbs. So these are all biblical ways God prunes us. Um, but it's not what Jesus says here. So we better look at what Jesus says uh, when we're looking at this passage. Um, so let's do that. Where am I looking at? Yes, verse 3. Uh, what does it say in verse 3? The way that you are pruned or cleaned. This is a question. You can answer this one. What does it say in verse 3? How are the disciples already cleaned? They've heard him speak. They've heard him speak. Yeah, his word. Yeah. So one of the ways, and Jesus is pointing this out as being the key way for the disciples, the way that he proves us is listening to his word. The disciples have been doing that for three years. How do we listen to God's word? Well, of course, the main way is the Bible. So are we digging into the Bible to hear what Jesus says? Are we actually reading about Jesus? Sometimes we go flip straight to the Psalms or to uh, the letters for a quick fix of a few phrases that we can pick out for our quiet time, but we're actually listening to what Jesus said and letting us transform him. The other rest of the Bible, of course, is Jesus' word too. Not taking that away. But are we listening to what Jesus says? And are we listening to Jesus' word marries up with what the scripture says through each other through uh, the spirit's quiet whisper inside us through words that we speak to each other through preaching through conversations through the spirit working in prophecy or, or knowledge are we listening so that we can be changed and as God does change us through experiences and difficult things come are we looking at that experience in light of Jesus' word to interpret what it means? Not just to let the experience mould us, that can do that for, it, for anybody, can it? But to look at God's word and say, Jesus, what are you teaching me in this? Maybe less why is, you, why is this happening, but what are you teaching me? And letting God prune us in those things. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are gardeners. Any gardeners here? One or two? Um, if you're not a gardener, you might not know why we prune things. Uh, you know, apart from you know, just making things a bit smaller because they've got the iron hand. So let's try and marry up a few pruning tips with uh, some questions to ourselves about what God might be doing to prune us at the moment. Okay, so gardening. What's God doing for us? Let us ask ourselves the question, is God doing this or does God need to do this for me just now? Okay, so when you're pruning a new bush, uh, I've got a lovely rose, climbing rose bush, and I have to prune it every year to make it, make that lovely span with every branch getting a chance to produce flowers without getting overpowered. The first job is to remove the old woody growth. To cut off wood that's been there for, stems that have been there for quite a while, they used to serve a really useful purpose at producing flowers at the end of it, which comes fruit in time. But they're not really doing that anymore. So are we becoming comfortable because we've been doing this for a rather long time? We've had habits or ways of doing church or quiet time that once were really helpful, but have now just become a routine. And they're not really changing us to produce uh, fruit. Does God need to cut out some of the dead wood, some of the old wood, some of the ways of doing church, even as a new church like you are now? Most of you will have long church histories of what church looks like. Is God asking you to remove some of the comfort things and look at allowing new ways, new things, new life? Come through. I'm not saying new is better than old, 
what I'm saying is that things are not, no longer producing real fruit in terms of reaching out to the outside world that need to go. Okay, second thing you do is remove diseased stems, anything that's got mold growing on it. Um, and we can maybe think about that as the sin that gets into our lives. The selfishness, the bit that says actually coming here is for me, isn't it? Yeah, I need to come here every week for my benefit. Is God asked, pointing at something in our lives that is not in keeping with Jesus' character that he needs to remove? And that's painful. Because often we hold on to these things quite tightly. But does God need to prune that away from us? Next part of pruning, now you've got a bit of a shape, is to start picking the strong buds, the strong little shoots that are coming up the branches, so that they're going to grow this year to be the fruiting uh, steps. Okay? In a vine and in my rose bush, it's the new growth that year that produces the fruit. So you want to pick the, the strong ones so that they've got the best chance of producing fruit. Uh, and also to have the strength to bear the weight of the fruit uh, so that they don't, they don't break. And maybe that's something of what God does when he puts us through hard uh, and difficult circumstances to grow that perseverance and character that Paul talks about. Because sometimes bearing the fruit of Jesus is hard. Some of the loving that we're expected to do which looks like fruit to people, is difficult and challenging. And sometimes God prunes us to give us the strength to rely on him, not our own strength. We're not talking about pruning the best people. We're talking about pruning for God's strength in us to do what God has for us to do in producing fruit. So if you're in the middle of hard times, Talked about asking God, what are you teaching me in this? Is God letting us grow stronger in relying on him to produce more fruit? Um, okay, two more things about pruning. Pruning is not about individual branches. It is pruning individual branches, and God is about changing us in our walk with God. But it's actually about... Um, Pruning the whole bush so the whole uh, vine has the right shape, um, so that the whole vine doesn't have one big section of branch shading all the branches underneath it, so that they can't really get enough light to produce their own fruit. You have to balance it out. And as we look at what it means to be a vine as a body of people, is God pruning something? Pruning what I do or you do because they want, God wants to allow other people to grow into fruit within the body. We're not meant to have one or two big strong branches that try and produce all the fruit and do it all themselves. We're about trying to make it so everybody can fruit and share in the work of the vine. So are you trying to do everything yourself in whatever area of church that you work with? When God's maybe asking us to step back a little for other people to grow and to fruit and to share together. Okay, and the last thing. Sometimes all you can do with a bush is to renovate it. And that means cutting a hole off. It's quite a big job and you're bringing it right back down to really the core of the plant. And sometimes God wants to do that for us as individuals, sometimes as a church, to bring us back to the core of what it means to be really close to Jesus and almost to start again. That might be a word for somebody here or for the church, I'm not sure. But we have to be cut back to what it means to be in the vine with Jesus, and then grow from that. Okay, I'm going to pause for a minute and just let you think about 
What is it that God might be pruning in you as a person or as a body for a church? I'm literally going to stop talking for a minute. And I'm going to let you ask God, what do you want to prune in me? And if something is coming to mind, maybe nothing will, but if something's coming to mind, maybe you're willing to say, Jesus, Father, please prune me. God is usually not a bully. Sorry, I don't think that sounded right. God usually wants our submission for him to work in our lives and to bring us. Not always. Because he knows what he's doing. He's the gardener. So, a minute pause just to think about what we've said so far before we move on. to come back to that at the end. I just thought it was important just to pause at that point, at that point before we look at the next part. So we're thinking now about how you remain in the vine. If Jesus had stopped at pruning, especially if we think of pruning as being about just removing bad habits and sin, and I hope I've shown you that it's much more than that, we could be left with the impression that being a disciple of Jesus is actually about following rules and standards, something quite dry and mechanical. You know, Jesus said this, I do that. But Jesus moves on to remaining, and this is actually at the heart of what he means by being in the vine. Being a branch is about an organic, living, vital connection with the rest, with the trunk, with the rest of the vine. And being a disciple is about a vital, pulsating relationship, ongoing, daily relationship with Jesus and with the God and the Father. It's so um, interconnected and complex that we find it quite difficult to have words in our vocabulary to describe it. Um, and Jesus talks about being uh, me and you and you and me. Interestingly, he doesn't say, I am the trunk and you are the branches. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. But there's something really intimate and closely connected, isn't there? Even as a branch, Jesus is still in that bit. And that's how it's supposed to be. Sorry, yes, that's what I meant. Even as branches, Jesus is still in us and with us and we're connected into him. And he's already talked about this. Uh, he says, a couple of chapters ago, he's saying, I'm in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And he uses the same language to talk about how Jesus is part of the Father, and the Father is part of him, and the Spirit is part of him. It's such an amazing uh, interconnection. We can't quite grasp it. We like things to be one thing or the other. You're you, and I'm he's, yeah, but it's together, isn't it? And we don't even have an English word to describe it that fits one English word. The different translations use different things. So the NIV talks about remaining, being connected, staying. But the ESV and the other, some of the other translations talk about it abiding, living with, being in the same house as, being apart. Do you see how closely we have to be knitted together with Jesus? to be effective branch members. Um, it's about relationship, not just a head thing or an acknowledgement or a set of beliefs, it's about relationship. It's our spirit to his spirit. And again, that's coming up in verses uh, that you're gonna do over the next few weeks. And at this point, I wanted to speak about uh, how you sit with Jesus 
Uh, maybe you have quiet times, you have times when you sit and you read the Bible and you meditate on, on the Word. Our house group has been, small group has been learning about how to meditate with Scripture. Uh, not just for knowledge, but for part of the communication. Uh, you might have heard of uh, practicing the presence of Jesus. Uh, talking to Jesus about everything that happens in your week, everything that happens through and finding him in every little thing. And we've been worshipping as part of being in Jesus. And also verse 9 says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Being in the vine is about accepting Jesus' love. Is that difficult for you to accept love? Maybe because of your background. Just to be able to sit and relax and say, You love me. And that is how you join with me, by your love. And it would be wonderful to talk more about how you do that. But a bit like we said a minute ago, it's not what Jesus says here about how to remain. So we're going to look at what Jesus says here about how to remain. All that is important. And it might surprise you, it surprised me. I'll tell you why in a minute, but let's look at the verse that it talks about. Verse 10. What does it say in verse 10? I'll not ask you to share it out now, but I want you to look if you've got it there. I'll read it. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love than has no one in this to lay down his life for one's friends. How does Jesus say we're to remain in him? How do we remain? How do we stay connected to the Bible? If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Does that make you uncomfortable? Because it's not what we think of normally, is it? Sounds a bit like you've got to do lots of good things to please God and then he'll accept you. That's not what this is saying. Okay? We're already in the vine. We've already been accepted into love in Jesus. <coughs> but we need to let it sink in that Jesus is expecting something here as we remain in him to follow his commands. And he has many things he says we should do. But he narrows it down and focuses it for his disciples as the most important thing he wants to tell them to do, just as he's about to leave them, a saying, love one another. So how does that work? How does that work? I don't know if you've seen any of the little birds that are uh, flying around at the moment. We've got quite a lot in our garden. Uh, and you often see two birds flying together. I don't know if it's mating rituals or one trying to chase another one off. But when they fly, they fly together, don't they? And it looks as though they're just, one of them's changing direction, but the other one just mirrors it exactly. Have you seen that? Maybe that's what Jesus means as he expects us, as we remain in him, to love one another. You see, if Jesus is flying, in his love, if he is acting in certain ways, if his priorities are certain things, we need to follow him as he goes through. And we need to go in the same direction to remain with him. Yeah? If we don't follow what Jesus' priorities and actions and instructions are, we go off in a different direction and we no longer remain with him in what he's doing. I wondered if that was a helpful um, way of looking at Jesus' command to love one another as the way of remaining in him. It's not actually that often 
that we speak in. We do talk about loving one another a lot, don't we? But it's not often we tie it so closely to how to follow Jesus because we, we, we sometimes make it very personal. It's about what I do in my quiet time, not what I do when I come to church and I worship. But actually, Jesus here is saying it's really, really important that we love one another as part of being branches of disciples. So I want you to have a look around at each other. Have a look around each other. It's a bit embarrassing. I know it's not very North East, is it? To look at each other in their eyeballs. These are the people that you ask to love. Loving Jesus isn't a solitary pursuit or just a spiritual experience. Uh, it's not about gooey feelings. It's about deep, practical, sacrificial, costly, potentially life costing love. It's about the doing together. It's about forgiving when we've messed it up and we mess it up a lot, don't we? about being alongside in the mess of everyday life. Are you doing that as a church? Not just on a Sunday. Are you making connections with each other? <laughs> um, Jesus gives us two pictures in this part about how uh, loving looks. There's the first big hit you in the face one. No one loves more by giving them giving up life for his friend. Wow. It's hard for us to think about, isn't it? In other countries where they where they have a lot of persecution, that's easier to understand as an actual reality. But it does mean that we have to be uh, costly and uh, sacrificial in our love. But he also calls us friends. And loving is about being friends. Are we friends with one another? Are you friends with one another? Not just the people that you necessarily get on with, or the people that you naturally have an affinity to and meet, but are you building real, spending time with people, friendships, that you can go through life together? When Jesus says, if you follow my commands, love one another, it requires an intentionality, doesn't it? When I first prepared this in the cafe in Dundee, I wanted to say, uh, remain in Jesus, have all these really wonderful times with Jesus, and then our love fruit would sort of ooze out at the end sort of automatically. But actually that wasn't what he was saying. He was saying, go ahead and do the loving, and then you'll bear fruit. Love is part of the fruit. But doing the love makes the fruit grow. Because as we start out following Jesus, every following, if you're following someone, you have to start moving forward, don't you? And as the disciples followed Jesus, they had to leave what they had and they had to start following. Um, and so it's intentional that we say, I'm going to try and love this person in the church. Um, and then I think as we, as we start that moving out, we'll find very quickly we're in that dance with Jesus, finding out how he does that. And of course, through his power and strength, it's not that we're trying to bash the fruit out ourselves. Okay. To be really half-connected to Jesus people, we need that are trying to push the fruit out themselves. We need to be taking his source and his love and his uh, strength to do that. And by the way, we don't stop at loving each other. Uh, Jesus' most precious second command was to love our neighbour as ourselves. Uh, remember, we're making uh, fruit to be representative to God outside here too. It's important we love each other, but it also quickly spreads out to other people. Okay, it's for other people that we are the vine. All right, let's move to our last bit then, just to think about these fruit uh, for a minute. Verse 15, uh, no, verse 18. 
access. Now let's try again using verse 18. Verse 8 says, This is to my Father's glory. You bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So I said near the start, our fruit is our Jesus-iness. How like Jesus we are. All the characters and actions and priorities that are recognisable in Jesus should be appearing in our lives as our fruit. All our characteristics, our action, his actions, our priorities should be the same as Jesus was in his life. And that's what should be appearing as our fruit for other people to see so that they recognise who Jesus is. Um, so if you're wondering what that looks like, uh, here's some homework I did say as a teacher. Uh, then if you ever sit on a Sunday afternoon, look at what, something that pinged up in your brain in the sermon and look and dig a bit deeper, or, or in, later in the week. Look at what Jesus is like in the Gospel. Just flick through all the pages and say, how did he treat this person? What was he like in that person? What did he do? And think those are the characteristics that are meant to be appearing in my life as fruit. Or you could look at some of the other passages that talk about fruit and love in the New Testament. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Have I got them all? I can't remember. Okay. Are those things appearing in my life? Or the love passage. Um, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. What does that look like in my life? Praying, God, make me like you, Jesus, when I'm a branch. Make my fruit appear to be like you, so others can see, as you look to reach out to the area that we talk around about you. <coughs> And the other thing this fruit looks like is answered prayer. Did you see the two times in the passage that Jesus says, ask whatever you want and God will do it. We know that's not always what happens when we pray. But the caveat here is that we're praying from the place of being in the vine, becoming like Jesus. And that's what Jesus is talking about. As you become like me, as you have my characteristics, you want my actions, you uh, have my priorities, <coughs> ask God to bring those things. And he will delight to make that fruit grow. Whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. So what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus as you all together are a vine. And we are all together are disciples for this area. It looks like a vine. Jesus is the true vine, the true way of seeing what the Father is like. We are the branches. Jesus in us and us in him together. Not removed, but to be pruned for more Jesus in us, to be more fruitful and everybody to be fruitful. We need to be, we need to remain in that organic, vital relationship to the person of Jesus, the actual source of the fruit that's gonna come through the Spirit. And we need to remain by loving each other. How do you need to love people here today? What might need to be different about how you relate to one another as you seek to grow to be a church together? Yes, new building, hopefully. But as we were praying in the prayer meeting this morning, the, the body is stones being built together. The people are being built together. How can you love to be built together? We need to bear fruit, make sure our lives are Jesus in. That is our goal. Not for the sake of the vine, but for the sake of people outside these walls. 
and we need to represent Jesus, uh, represent the Father to the world, remembering that he is a good pruner, but he's also an excellent grafter. He's grafted us into the vine. If you don't feel that connection with Jesus today, if you don't have that sense of what following Jesus is about, it's about being in a relationship with Jesus and it changing your life to look like Jesus. If you don't feel you're part of the vine, maybe today is the chance to say to God, I want to be grafted in. Because he will. I'm going to finish with verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. For all this doing, it's God that does it first. And I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love one another. That's it, let's pray together and Derek's going to lead us in some questions. Jesus, uh, Father, we want to submit to you. We want to know more of that living relationship with you that keeps with you as closely as those two birds flying together. We want your help to know how to love each other in really practical uh, ways. Whether that's easy with some people or harder, or requires forgiveness, or difficult conversations. We want you to prune us as a body to be more fruitful together. So we surrender. Perhaps for the first time. Perhaps for one of many times that we remember that we need to be surrendered to you. Thank you for loving us first and joining us together for the excitement of being part of you, representing Father to the world.